that is guided by philosophy, which is the study of the processes governing all thoughts, principles, and laws. The predecessors of the League were formed during the great upsurges of the National Liberation Movement. We did not base ourselves on that movement. Rather, we tried to use that upsurge. Oh, okay. Oh, wait, yeah. <laughs> Don't go, he said. <laughs> You know, you get arthritis, you hurt all over and everything else. But you did get one prick, right? Yes. That uh, you, you love the young woman that you've known since they've been teenagers will come up and hug you. So we're, we're not going to take that away from you. I don't care how much you think. Okay, yes. <laughs> well, let's get back to business. <laughs> The predecessors of the League uh, were formed during the great upsurge of the National Liberation Movement. We did not base ourselves on that movement. Rather, we tried to use that upsurge and that transformation to expose and exacerbate the contradiction between productive forces and productive relations. We clearly understood that this contradiction was the only force that could create the conditions for a transfer of political power from the capitalists to the working class. And this is why we did not collapse with the relative completion of the National Liberation Movement. Later, our philosophical approach allowed us to understand the significance of the electronic revolution, the emergence of a new revolutionary sector of the working class, and the beginnings of an objective communist movement now, we use that term a lot, and I think sometimes in our organization we tend sometimes to substitute phrases for well thought out uh, ideas, right? So I want to make sure that we're, in, we're together with this concept of an objective communist movement. I can remember my, not too long ago, well, 15 years ago, I went to a meeting. I was encouraged to go to a meeting which were a number of ex-communists and ragtag groups and so forth. <laughs> And I got up and I said something about our con an objective communist movement. <clears throat> and the guy who had been the former um, chair of the Communist Party in Chicago got up and started laughing and he says, who in the hell ever heard of an objective communist movement? So I just sat down. I said, you know, <laughs> you can lead a hog to the trough. But <laughs> you can't do much else with them. Right? So, so I, want, I want to be sure, just because it has never before been a an objective communist movement. And the communist movement has always been a movement of people who believed in communism. Yeah. And if they can't grasp, if we don't grasp the difference between then and now, the objective foundations of then and now, and what then and now <laughs> means, you know, historically, for the strategy and tactics of the revolutionary movement, we're lost. Yeah. So, so the revolutionary movement can never be just a movement of people who want to fight. The revolutionary movement has to be a movement of people who think. And thinking is a lot harder than fighting, so people fight rather than think, right? And so anyway, <laughs> uh, I want to get back here that, that, um, that uh, what do we mean by an objective communist movement? Well, that movement arises when there is such an intense antagonism between private ownership of the, of the necessaries of life and the social character of distribution and, consum and consumption to the extent that the entire social order begins to collapse. At this point, communism, which is society's ownership of socially necessary means of life, communism moves from the ideological level to the level of the actual and practical. And just to give you an example of this, that what are you going to do with a bank the size of, uh, say, Chase? Or what, what are you going to do with that bank? Going to break it up into little banks and start the process over again? There's nothing you can do except make it the property of the people. Yeah. That's what communism is. Yeah. Not, there's a difference between communism and Marxism, right? Yeah. Marxism is an intellectual, scientific current within communism. But it itself is not communism. And I think that we have to somehow or another 
make these breakthroughs. Now, nobody, <laughs> well, that's probably not true, but you're not gonna find many people who are gonna make that statement. Yeah. Because of them, Marx invented communism. Yeah. <laughs> and that's not at all true, right? Yeah. He only yeah. made a scientific analysis of that process. So, 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 never, not, not in Marx's time, or any time before now, has there been a situation where the productive forces are so gigantic, so concentrated, so absolutely necessary to life, that they can no longer remain in private hands? What's the big deal about it? I mean, that, that's the way our forefathers thought about the bow and arrow, right? Yeah. So nobody owned a bow and arrow. They belonged to the tribe. They were too important to be in private hands. And so, so what we're talking about, nothing new. Only an extenuation of the history, you know, and under uh, modern circumstances. But clearly, under such uh, circumstances as this the evolution, the development of, a, of an objective communist uh, uh, movement, uh, it would, and when I see this objective communist movement, I don't mean communist groups. I mean a mass of people who are spontaneously moving in a certain direction, right? And so, so under such uh, circumstances, it became necessary to liquidate the Communist Labor Party. Uh, the Communist Labor Party, of course, strove for a vanguard role in the social struggle. And, uh, and uh, we had to abandon that and in order to form a, an organization of propagandists that could answer the needs of this moment. The needs of this moment is not for organizers. It is for teachers for people who can get out there and explain what in the world is going on. That, uh, I used to make the converse laugh, I used to say that uh, 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 black folks were the most intelligent in the world. I said, why do you say that? I said, just listen to them. The minute they meet each other, they say, what's happening, man? Because <laughs> if, you, if you don't know what's happening, how in the world are you? <laughs> How are you going to come to any conclusions, right? <laughs> so we can all be black folks, we can all. <laughs> we can start off and ask, what is happening? Never mind all this junk that's out there. You know, never mind all this propaganda. Look at how concretely and objectively, what is the process we find ourselves in? And then we can make some strategy and tactics for our organization. Yes. It was clear that an organization that was fighting for, for a vanguard role under these conditions of change was nonsense. We love the CLP. We had to abandon it. And of course, people were furious. And uh, about half of them quit, right? <laughs> it, was, it was one of the very difficult periods of time. But, but, the, but, but the new situation that was emerging called not for organizers, but called for a call for teachers, people who were able to grapple with this tremendous new thing that was coming about, changing the economy, changing social organization, changing social relations, and so forth. So, so uh, um, this new stage of the revolutionary process demanded that we abandon one form of organization and create another. And we did so, under very difficult circumstances. And we can quite proudly uh, point to our accomplishments along this line. Today we have a solid core of candidates. We have our own theoretical and political line. We have a series of excellent presses. We have a stable office location from which to work. And we're in the process of overcoming our financial difficulties. Essentially, commerce, our foundations have been built. The next stage, and the convention of course must grapple with this, this next stage is the outward motion of the league. Now this outward motion can be accomplished only if the league is clear as to its mission. And we can, we can no longer afford to have members who simply agree with us. Each member must have a mission. Each member in some way must contribute to our propaganda effort. We must become an army on the march with purpose, discipline, and clarity. Comrades, just in conclusion, it's clear that the ice of some 50 years is breaking, that the tides are beginning to flow. The moment that we prepared for is upon us. 
And let this convention again raise the battle cry of the old international to the forge comrades and scrap where they are in this hot.